Good morning to the saints of God and to all of our visiting friends. We are thankful that you are here. And as we have done thus far, we have followed the biblical pattern, the biblical instructions on how we ought to worship. A cappella singing without any accompaniment. We sing and make melody in our heart and we sing to the Lord. We're not singing to impress one another. We're singing to the Lord. Every first day of the week, we come together to remember the price that was paid on Calvary's cross. The sacrificial lamb of God who shed his blood for the sins of the world. We have rendered our prayers to the Father in Jesus' name by his authority. We've given as we have prospered. There's no tithing in the Lord's church. We give as we have prospered to show the sincerity of our love. And as we take this time to preach God's word, it will come from none other than that same Bible that guides us in how we worship. But we left worship up to us. Some of you would say we need a, maybe a marching band coming out here to just kind of liven things up and wake us up. No, if Jesus dying on that cross and giving his life doesn't wake you up, then I don't know what will. Amen. God does not need us to liven up worship. We need to wake up and pay attention to his holy and inspired word. And so as we think about what we want to deal with today, and we welcome all of our visitors. We're so glad you are here. We may have some folks in town because of marching bands. I don't know. But one thing I do know is we're happy that you are here. Everybody just smile if you can. Even if you got a mask, you can smile underneath that mask. It's all right. It's okay to smile, to let people know that you, you're thankful that they are here. Saw some nice, bright smiles out there. We have one job to do today, and that's to preach the holy and inspired word of God. Our lesson text comes to us from John, the fifth chapter, beginning at verse 15. John, the 15th chapter, John, the fifth chapter, beginning at verse number 15. If you have your Bibles, I would like you to turn over there so you can follow along throughout this lesson so that you can uh, just make sure that those things that are spoken are certainly from the word of God, not my opinion, uh, but truly God's word. And so as we look at the text today in John, the fifth chapter, beginning at verse number 17, verse 15, I'll get it right eventually. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus, which had made him whole. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus, which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them, my father worketh hitherto and I work. God is always at work. And when you think, talk about there's three that bear record in heaven, first John five and seven, the father, son, and the Holy spirit. And these three are one. These three agree in one three distinct personalities, God the Father who sent God the Son. And when Jesus was on this earth, he said, I will send you another comforter. See, Jesus brought comfort. Jesus brought healing. Jesus brought the truth. And he said, before he left this earth, I will send you another comforter. And so this particular text, uh, we're going to break it down in just a minute, but in context, but I want to give you three key words for today. Three key words, rule of three. Keep it simple so that everybody can understand. You know, again, hope, compassion, and criticism. Those are the big three today. Hope, compassion, and criticism. We got to deal with all three. Hope, compassion, and criticism. So when you think about hope, that earnest expectation for something. You can hope to get a job. Hope is not a strategy, by the way. Some people just have, what's your strategy? I just hope. Unemployed still pays the same. Hope is an earnest expectation for something. The Bible lets us know that hope that is seen is not hope. We have an earnest expectation to go to a place that we have never seen, heaven. So we think about hope, and it is, we're going, in, in the context of John 5, you'll see it, compassion. And again, we, we live in a world that, where people just lack compassion for one another. Compassion is that sympathetic pity, concern for the un, misfortunes or the, uh, the adverse experiences that people go through. 
Do you have, if you see a need, what do you do about it? Compassion. We see in scripture, and we certainly can't exhaust it today, when Jesus was moved with compassion. What does that mean? It means that, you know, he saw a need and he did something about it. Let me just implore of all the Christians, beseech you is a, more, is a better word, a more appropriate term. Beseech means I plead with you. All children of God, members of the body, the church of Christ, let us be more compassionate people. Because the world is callous. The world is apathetic, apathetic. So I don't want to just give you words and insult your intelligence. You already know these definitions, great. It's being reinforced. If you don't, you're welcome. So the bottom line, apathy, apathy. You just don't care. No feeling, no concern, no sympathy, no pity. You know what? Indifference, it just doesn't matter. Please teach your kids, especially if you have teenagers, to give you direct answers to direct questions. Parents, you listening? So, we, no, it just does, it doesn't matter. No, it does matter. Amen. So, because then when they, when they apply for a job and this person says, okay, I want to offer you a job, you're going to make whatever salary you want, we're going to give you benefits, travel package, it doesn't matter. Intentionality, a word that I just use just about every day. Intentional means being deliberate and being purposeful. Saints, we have to be, and this applies to kids in school. Who wants to uh, go to the board and write? It doesn't matter. You're sitting there just like everybody else. You raise your hand. Amen. You're going to, because everybody's, you're always being interviewed. I've done it in presentations I've, I've had with high school kids. Everybody's sitting back, want to be just like everybody else. Then I ask a question, nobody raises their hand. And then every now and then you get one that may raise their hand. And I go over and I may give them $20. After that, then everybody wants to raise their hand. I says, too late. See, it was you were apathetic. So now you were moved and say, I got some money in my pocket, but don't you raise your hand because it's going to stay in my pocket. Just happened to found this this morning, actually. Uh, my point is this. Don't wait for somebody else to do something that you can do. Because what the way you respond has an impact on other people. But see, apathy as, as uh, contrasted with compassion, compassion, I feel for you. There's sympathy, there's pity, there's concern as opposed to just being indifferent. And now a word that we need to make sure we give in context, the word criticism. See, criticism is feedback. Criticism is analysis. When you give somebody feedback, now you can also just be critical for the sake of just being critical. See, again, don't be that, be more compassionate saints. Don't be that critical one. Because see, feedback can be constructive. You've heard of constructive criticism. In our men's training class, we have these young men, they come up, they, they, they preach, they read scriptures, and we give them constructive feedback. We don't say, who do you think you are, little boy? We never do anything like that to hurt their, 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 their conscience. We'll say, we need you to project, hit your words, watch the punctuation. That's constructive feedback. Based on what you did, we analyze it and give you feedback. So we understand that we know criticism, you express your comments, your judgment, analysis, in other words but this can be adverse and disapproving. So I hope you understand. The reason I give you this backdrop of these three key words, hope, compassion, I had to work in apathy to give you a contrast. So really four, three key words with one contrast. And then of course, criticism. Because when we go to John chapter five, and I want you to turn over there, because I got to take you to Jerusalem today. We're going back to Jerusalem and there's a certain place in Jerusalem that is referenced. I'll leave the image on the screen because that'll give you some, because as we look at things geographically, we can read it in the context of scripture, but it's important that as we go through, you hear descriptors in the text to be able to see it, to help you, to help us all learn and reinforce the, the biblical education we all need. John chapter five, turn over there if you have your Bibles. John, the fifth chapter. John chapter five. Brothers, if you help me out, John chapter five. The Bible said, pick it up in about verse number uh, three. I'll be there in just a minute. After this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. There's your context. Geographically, Jesus went, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Verse number two, and there, now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market. Now you look at some translations, they have the sheep gate. 
You have the sheep market. This is a very common place adjacent to the temple. We recognize, so people knew this place. The sheep market, the sheep gate, at a, a, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue, Bethesda, Bethesda, having five porches. Let's pause there for a minute. Hebrew, Bethesda. You travel around the country, you will find probably 10, 20 hospitals. Bethesda, Bethesda. By translation, place of healing, place of mercy, place of grace. But also in the local context, some would call it a place of disgrace. I'll tell you why in a minute. Because see, it depends on, it depends on your perspective. There are, there are prominent places in Miami. And if you go to those places in order to get to that place, it happened recently. I took my wife out to dinner. And so as you go to this beautiful place, you got a lot of people under a bridge. They don't even have a home. Why do I use that example? Brothers, read from me, John 5. Pick it up in verse 3. Watch this. So watch this now. Watch this now. On these five porches, transit that word, those porches, large steps. So you got the pool of Bethesda, a place of mercy, a place of grace, a place of healing. That's why you see a lot of Bethesda hospitals. So in this, in this, the pool of Bethesda, you got these, these five, you know, steps, if you will. And the Bible says on these, in these, on these five porches, these large steps lay a great multitude, not a few, impotent or impotent. Yes, that's good. Go ahead, brother. <laughs> but so now these impotent folks were blind, halt, wither, waiting for the moving or the troubling of the water. So these people that were there, you know, the blind and paralyzed, lame, just, you know, in some kind, some translations talk about the, in, the invalids and the impotent. So these folks were had significant need physically. Let's just pause for a minute. So here you are, the pool of Bethesda, place of mercy, place of grace, place of healing. And you have these, all these porticos or these covered these covered areas, but then near the pool, there are these five porches, large steps. And on these porches, people, a great multitude of people that were paralyzed, sick, the Bible says withered, blind, halted, all sorts of physical ailments, physical frailties, waiting. Here's your hope. Expecting, believing that there's, they could be cured. They could be healed with the troubling of the waters. Verse four. For an angel went down and said to me into the pool, and troubled the water. Mm -hmm. Whosoever then returned after the troubling of the water, came in for the name of Christians will, uh, the bottom line, this speaks to a belief, a hope, an expectation. If water is troubled, less important about an angel, what they believe was that, that when the water was troubled, when the water moved, you see that in verse three, and we'll get to even further context later on. Who, he that was in that water, when the water was troubled or moved, would be healed. That is the hope. That was their belief. That was their expectation. And let me just pause for a minute, because today, brothers and sisters and visiting friends, even some, even anything, that's, that's scary. You say, so if you think about that, what Jesus said, if you don't believe that I am he, now we got to get in in context. Go to verse 23, Lenny. Go take it back one verse. Because he said, therefore, what did Jesus say? Know what therefore is there for? John 8, 23. Come on. Watch what Jesus said unto them. You are from beneath. Are from beneath. I, am I am from above. Hold your point right there. So quit putting your belief, your hope, your faith, your trust for your soul's salvation in man. A new gospel, a new and improved gospel. What's wrong with the one Jesus gave us? The good news of Jesus Christ, hey, you know, a new hermeneutic, the science of study in scriptures. Uh, give me something. We always want something new and improved. Now, anybody here that knows anything about music, this new stuff has nothing, com no comparison to the, amen. All they do is just take the old and sample it. 
Some of you don't know, you know about music, but you just, if some, of you, some of you like may like cars. The cars they build right now don't even compare to what used to be. So new and improved isn't always good for you. And there's nothing. So you find somebody saying, I, can, I have something better than the Bible. You better run in the other direction. They tickle our ears with something new. Kids that are growing up new. You guys are old fogey. Church of Christ. Believe you're the only one. Well, God only established one through his son, Jesus Christ. And even in the Lord's church, let me say this as clearly as I can into that camera. Even in the Lord's church, we have those seeking to be new and improve how about holding to that old gospel how about teaching just that old just that old just understand we have everything we need in the word of god we don't have to keep up with the denominational world just keep preaching the truth so these folks uh they jesus said well the bible lets us know that jesus says, I, you are from below i am from above read finish verse 23 of john 8 you are of this world. You are of this world. I am not of this world. And that same Jesus in the same in John chapter 18 and verse 36 says, My kingdom is not of this world. So Jesus said, You are from below. I'm from above. You are, you know, you are from uh, below. I am from above. Then he goes on to say, You are of this world. I am not of this world. So the church to our visiting friends is a heavenly institution that gives access to those on this earth. And Jesus is coming back again for his church, Ephesians chapter five, 28 and following. So I want you to understand today that Jesus says, except you believe that I am he, what does that mean? He that is from above, he that is not of this world, he that is head of a kingdom, put it in your notes, John 18 and verse 36, Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. So when people say to you, and we may have some folks in the audience, I don't know, I, I have no idea, uh, other than those that we know that attend here, we have some great bits and business here today. Thank you for being with us. We will not alter the truth because of anybody. We've had elected officials walking here expecting to speak. They need to sit down and hear the gospel. And it's that season again. They're going to come by. Okay, we stop by every other church. You're going to give him the mic. No, sir, no, ma'am. Have a seat. Thank you for being with us. And they may leave sometimes frustrated, but guess what they leave with? They've heard the truth of the gospel. You're welcome. Amen. Thank God. Forget me. Thank God. So man has an expectation. Do you know who you, you just left out of here? I know I saw a man with an entourage. So all of you heard the gospel. You coming back? Just to be clear. So don't anybody make any requests of the eldership. Well, you know, Senator so-and-so, that's great. Come on in and have a seat. We'll put you right here. Or we can put you in the back, wherever you want to sit, but you're going to sit and hear the gospel. You will not speak to the church. Back to our lesson. That was free. We have to believe. Jesus said, you don't believe that, I'm, that I have a kingdom? Because, see, man will let you know. See, we're so uh, predictable as mankind. Man wants you to know who's the founder. They may put their picture up, put founder. That's theirs. Man has a lot of churches. Man has a lot of churches. They will let you know where the headquarters is, who the head, where you send your quote unquote dues and everything else. That is not the kingdom Jesus Christ is talking about. Jesus has only one church. This may be the first and last time some of you ever hear me preach. Jesus Christ has only one church. Matthew 16 and verse 18, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. We got to stand on that to the day we die. But the whole world has opportunity. We are not saying in any way, because we'd be in sin, that we're better than anybody else. What we are saying is Christ established a designated place for those who believe, expect to make it to heaven. So speaking of hope and expectation, Jesus comes in, back to John 5. Jesus comes into contact with a 38-year-old man. John chapter 5. Let's pick it up. John, the fifth chapter. Let me drive a little bit, brothers, and I'll come back to you. John chapter 5. The Bible says in verse five, everybody there? And a certain man was there, there, where was he? Pool of Bethesda, place of mercy, place of grace, place of healing, where was he? He was there by the pool. So Jesus, a certain man was there, which had an infirmity 30 and eight years. He had, he was in his physical condition for 38 years. 
When Jesus saw him alive, so he's there on those steps, the porches talked about in the previous text, previous verse. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had now had been now a long time in that case or condition, he saith unto him, will thou be made whole? I want to, let's deal with wants and needs for a minute. Wants and needs. See, we want stuff. But don't, let us never confuse wants and needs. Why were people there? Because they wanted to be in, put in the water, and when the water is troubled, they could be healed. We have the context in John chapter 5, previous verse, verses 2 through 4. 2 and 3 primarily. So now, the Bible says, Jesus asked him the question, will thou be made whole? Do you want to be healed? The obvious answer is, is yes, but his expectation, hope believing in something, an earnest expectation, his expectation is, well, pick me up and put me in the water. John chapter five, stay there. The impotent man answered him. So he didn't, just, instead of just saying, yes, I want to be healed. See, this is what we do sometimes. You want a ride? No, I really want a Mercedes. No, do you want a ride? We miss the simple blessing because we are looking so far beyond as we, because we want, we want. We, see where I'm pointing? We want. <laughs> the impotent man answered, he was paralyzed. He was lying there. What, what a scene. I talked about driving through Miami and it's a, it's a sad scene. I work in youth and family development every single day. Partnering with organizations that feed the homeless and bring people in and shelters and all of that. It is a sad scenario. Some, many people are that there because they said, I just want to live under a bridge the rest of my life. They've gone through a, ser a series of misfortunes. Some have got caught up with addictions that put them there. So the point of the matter is, when pe we talk about a place of healing, a place of grace, some people even today lack compassion and turn up their nose when you see somebody that's downtrodden. You don't know that story. And yes, we know sometimes people seek to, let me put it in uh, terms you can understand, get over. And so we had a situation one time, someone said, I need something, I need some money. We said, no, okay, we're gonna get you some food right now. I don't want any food. Well, you just said you were hungry. So we will give you what you need. And a person ran and went away mad. So again, intentions may not always be sincere, but do what we can to give somebody what they need. You say you're hungry, let me get you some food. Amen. The impotent man answered him, verse seven. Sir, I have no man. Here it is. He to find out what he wants. Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled, when the water is moving, to put me into the pool. What did Jesus ask him? Do you want to be healed? I don't have anybody put me in the pool. He was paralyzed and he goes into more detail. But while I am coming, another step down before me. I can, there's no way I'm gonna beat somebody else in my condition. I need somebody to put me in position ahead of those who are just jumping in the pool when the water's trouble. Look at Jesus. What did Jesus say to him, brethren? John five and verse eight. Jesus saith unto him, rise, rise get up. Take up your bed, take up your mat, and more, more practically speaking, rot, rot, get up, get your mat, and do what? Walk. And walk. And I wonder what happened when the Jesus uh, on this earth, what, what happened? And he, three days later, an hour later, immediately read, the man was made whole. Jesus asked, wait a minute now, Jesus asked the question, do you want to be made whole? There's nobody. Quit making excuses when we, God is always working. And sometimes we have everything mapped out. Yeah, I want to get married, but this faithful man of God that's there in service working, he just about five inches too short. And I'm still waiting on God. Wants and needs. You need a faithful man. If he were only six foot six, like Michael Jordan, we'd be able to work with him, but you know, he just, he faithful. Wants and needs. And that tall, diabolical one, six, six. 
said, you, you, you believe in things? I don't believe in Jesus. Well, you know, maybe we can work something out. Wants and needs. Immediately, John 5 and 9, immediately the man was made whole, took up his bed, read, Gail, and walked. And walked. Same Wait a minute. So 38 years, 38 years he's in that condition, and now he's walking. 38 years paralyzed. The active sound of Jesus' voice, get up, get your mat, and walk. And immediately he did just that. And the same day was the, Seven. so I've given, we talked about hope and earnest expectation. We've talked about compassion, being sympathetic, pitiful, being full of pity, concerned about others. So Jesus had compassion on this man. Do you want to be healed? He knew, Jesus said he, the Bible says Jesus knew he had been in that condition for a long time. And now this man is healed. But we're going to spend the rest of our time dealing with something that can get in the way of Christians even growing. It can suppress our growth and development. How we look at other people, we, look, we don't look at the, the joy. Sadly, we look at something else because the Bible says it just happened to be on the Sabbath day. So I wonder who had issues with that. Brethren, John 5 and verse 10, come on. The Jews, therefore, because it was a Sabbath day, said unto him, that, was that was cured, that was healed. Jesus healed this man. And the Jews said, what? It is a Sabbath day. Wait a minute. Thank God, man, that's all right. Look at you now. I don't know the man's name. We don't have context on that. 38 years. Look, I was going to use Tyrone as an example. Look at you, Tyrone. Thank God. You know it's a Sabbath day. Man, was, wasn't able to walk for 38 years. Now he's walking. They're like, you know it's a Sabbath day. Read, Gil. It is not lawful for you to carry that day. Why are you carrying your mat on the Sabbath day? Don't major in the minors. What do I mean by that? Don't major in the minor. So you may be critical of something. When Jesus had to talk about the moat that's in someone's eye and the log that's in your eye, you, you know, this man was, again, families, please, with your kids, be open, be honest, admit your mistakes. If we're to ever grow, we need to understand. They were, so now we get into criticism. They're criticized, hope, compassion, apathy. They were apathetic to his physical condition. Who cares that you now can walk after 38 years? We can steal the joy from folks because we're looking to be critical of something. Y'all all right? I'm talking about us and the Jews now. Yeah, we have the story, but we got to make application. We have to understand, if you major in being critical and you minor or you failed compassion, that's going to suppress your spiritual growth and my spiritual growth. Compassionate. We may have someone that's, again, we got some folks that, Certainly, the elders are doing it continuously, but our, our lost sheep, we got folks that haven't been here in a long time. The first thing you say to them is, well, where have you been? Saw you on social media, see you doing everything else. No, compassion. Watch our tongue. Because if that were the shoe was on the other foot, as my grandmama would say, how would you want to be treated? Compassion, how about a hug? He's walking with his mat, having been paralyzed 38, 38 years, healed by the master Jesus. And the first thing they say is, you know, it's a Sabbath day and why, you know, it's, on, it's not lawful. Spiritual police talked about that last week. Evangelism is based on rooted and grounded in compassion. Evangelism is rooted and grounded in compassion. You need to come visit with us. You need to come study with us or you can just go to hell. That's not a good talking point. It's not lawful for thee to carry thy mat on the, 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 the carry thy bed. He so he answered, here we go. He that made me whole. He that made me whole right now, it, he that made me whole, the same said unto me. So, so, he didn't, so he didn't know who Jesus was. The same, he said, he, he answered, he that made me whole, the same said unto me, this man told me to take up my bed and walk. Now watch this. Here comes a criticism. Read. Then asked they him. What man is that that said unto thee? Who is this man that said that to you? Read. And heal that was healed. That word wist not, that phrase means he did not know. He did not know who Jesus was. He didn't say, okay, Jesus healed me. He did not know. Wist not, did not know who it was. For Jesus had conveyed himself away. He just kind of, you know, like stealth mode, boom. 
He, he just kind of ran into the multitude, the crowd, being in that place. Let's pause for a minute. Compassion. Belief. If we're not careful, you're going to fall for it. You're going to fall for anything. Let me go to Acts chapter 19 and verse 4. Let me give you another example. Acts 19 and 4. It's kind of modern day idolatry. We got folks that will bow down to statues today, believe just about anything. We're going to close it out in a minute in John chapter 5. But, you know, again, in Acts chapter 19, please don't be so good. There are people that are hungry for something. Some of you that are here today may be just longing just to believe in something. Look no further than Jesus. Look no further than Jesus, because we have those in Acts chapter 19 and verse number four. What does the Bible say? Acts chapter 19 and the verse is about number four. Acts chapter 19 and verse four. Watch this. Then said Paul. Then said Paul. Of repentance. Read. Saying unto the people. Saying unto the people. They should believe on him which should come after him. They should believe on him which should come after him. Come on. So he so Paul said, now believe on Christ Jesus. Look no further. Now drop down for time's sake. Look at the same to verse 23. Same chapter, same book. Acts 19 and verse 23. Watch this. At the same time, same time. There was no small about that. So, see, the, those are the way or that way, the way of Christ. Remember the Lord's church. You didn't have, you know, church buildings everywhere. Miami Gardens Church of Christ. The, so, the, Miami Gardens is a location, and the church meets here. Nothing, no more, no less. The church meets here in Miami Gardens. This building is not the church. So there was no small stir about that way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So those who follow Jesus and believe in Jesus are of the way. So there was, but now watch this. Read. Here it is. Verse 24 is what I want. So now instead of some people believing on Jesus, there was a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith. He made little silver shrines for Diana, he, and he made a whole lot of money making these silver shrines to Diana. Some people are going to believe just about anything. So some will believe in Jesus. Some are bowing down believing in Diana. <laughs> and the Bible lets us know. So whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, sirs, you know by this craft we have our wealth. Some people will not obey the gospel, obey Jesus Christ, because they're making too much money telling a lie. I just give you that as a, and as a side to help us understand that some people, even today, in 2022, are still believing a lie. That's why we need to have compassion. And some will be critical when you come teaching the truth. Some are going to be critical, but God is at work today through his son, Jesus Christ. Let's go back and close out our lesson in John chapter five. I want you to have that as a rep. We may hit that on Wednesday, being a bit Lord's willing, Lord willing. But in John chapter five, so don't think that there won't be criticism of you living the way you do. Don't, don't think there won't be criticism of what we believe. We as members of the Lord's church must be willing and ready to endure criticism. How dare you speak that way? One church having to be baptized. Y'all think you're the only ones that are right. This, brothers and sisters, we have to be ready to give them a defense. Apologia, a defense. And that defense is not you versus me. It's not a physical battle. Just open the Bible and let's study together. I had someone approach me. And I, again, just, and just based on the way she was dressed, kind of like gypsy-like, I'll just put it that way. And she said, I was visiting another congregation. And she said, uh, and I watched people were, they, she came up to me, good preaching, but I got a question. So I had to kind of brace myself. And I saw everybody kind of, you know how when, you know, kids at school, when something's about to happen, they're like, ooh, here it goes. Everybody was in that position, kind of circled around. I'm like, this is interesting. She said, I'm a Catholic. I was born a Catholic. I said, okay, ma'am. So are you saying that Jesus was a bad economist? I said, tell me more. You said that there's only one church. Do you mean to tell me everybody else is going to be going to hell? So Jesus was a bad economist? 
I said, no, what I, what I believe, ma'am. I said, thank you for the question. What I believe is what the Bible says. Many are called, but few are chosen. That's not economy, that's obedience. I believe when Jesus said, you know, that not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Many will say they've done many things. I said, so you're talking about numbers. I'm talking about obedience. I'm looking at her face. I still like to preach it. And she walked away. People can frame their criticism. They can already have it nicely, neat, and packaged. So are you saying that Jesus, so now she's going to put me against Jesus. Are you saying Jesus is a bad economist? So no, when I see one church, when I see many and few, who said this? Jesus. So the same Jesus you're trying to put me against has already told us in his word. I believe his word, ma'am, and I would love for you to let's study more about his word. Thank you very much. So let's talk about criticism. So now Jesus is confronted. In John chapter five, I'll drive, brethren, I'll take it home. In John chapter five, you all back there with me? In John chapter five, we find that Jesus, verse 13, they asked this man, who healed you? I don't know, but the man told me to take up my bed and my mat and walk, and here I am. Who told you this? Well, he didn't know. John chapter five, verse 14, we're only taking to verse 17, and the lesson is yours. So the Bible says, afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, behold, look, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon thee. So now that you're walking 38 year old, <laughs> do right. So Jesus, unless something else more, much worse than paralytic, being paralyzed is going to come upon you. The words of Jesus, that'll get your attention, won't it? So the man departed and told the Jews, verse 15, that it was Jesus which had made him whole. Jesus healed me. So here comes the confrontation. Here comes the criticism. And therefore, as a result of the, the man who was healed at the pool of Bethesda, pool of mercy, pool of grace, place of healing. He wanted to be put into the water, but Jesus said, get up and take your mat and walk. We may not get what we want sometimes in life, brothers and sisters, but may, may we get what we need. But God will give us what we need. God will get us what we need. And therefore, did the Jews persecute Jesus? This is our lesson text. Why did they persecute Jesus? Again, if we have a hypercritical mindset, we miss the blessing. We miss the work of God. They wanted to persecute Jesus because they needed to make sure that they held the Sabbath. They therefore, as a result of Jesus healing on the Sabbath and sought to slay him, they wanted to kill Jesus because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them. And here it is. My father worketh hitherto. This is God at work. In other passages, Jesus had to confront the Jews. So if, you, if your donkey falls in a ditch or a pit, you're going to get him out on the Sabbath day? Is it not? You can't do good every single day? And so we, even in the Lord's church, may we be mindful. Let's do good every single day God gives us. Jesus said that in the response, he didn't want to sit and debate them on Sabbath keeping. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. He said, my father worketh hitherto. It's my father at work and I work. And so when you see Jesus's response and what we need to understand today, there's so much more we can deal with here. We'll come back and we'll, we'll pick it up at another time. But I want to close with this. This man needed to be healed. Today, we need salvation. What he wanted was some man to pick him up and put him there. I'm here to tell you, give me Luke 18 and 27. Man cannot save our souls. Man cannot save our souls. Luke, the 18th chapter. We're going to take a look. Give me 26 and 27. That'll give it even better context. Luke, the 18th chapter, beginning at verse 26. What does the Bible say, Brother Ferreris? And they that heard it said, heard it said who, then who then can be saved? What did they hear said? It's easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. We talked about the kingdom last week. God's domicile, the kingdom of God, where God dwells, where the saved are. So the, Jesus says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven because we get caught up in our stuff. So, then they, so their response was then, who then can be saved? 
See, man cannot save us. Luke 18 and verse 27, read. And he said, and he said the, things which are the things which are impossible with men are possible. Are possible. Do you believe that today? Do you believe that God is able? Do you believe that God is at work today? Do you believe that you can be saved today? I cannot save you. It is my, I'm just, I'm just, a, I'm just a messenger. But the message of salvation is rooted and grounded in God's word. Impossible to, for man to save you. So don't get, you know, again, I've seen it even in the Lord's church. Brothers have fallen away. Families have fallen away. Sisters have fallen away. And people are all bent out of shape. Do what you can to encourage them. But they are not your salvation. You can't live your life, their lives for them. Keep trusting in God. Showing compassion. And providing constructive criticism, even in counseling, constructive criticism, godly counsel hurts. It hurts because guess what? We are the ones that God's word is not going to change for you or for me. And so as we look at the word of God today, I pray that we can be a compassionate people. First Peter chapter three, first Peter uh, chapter three, and the verse is number eight. See, compassion is needed because all of us need help. All of us need encouragement because all of us have gone astray. Nobody here, pulpit included, nobody here has, it just, I'm just perfect. No, we all need help. First Peter chapter three and the verse is eight. What did Peter say? Read. Finally. Finally. So have this mindset as children of God, may we have this mindset, this perspective. Be you all of one mind, having what? Compassion. Wait, hold on. Having compassion. Brothers and sisters, it does make a difference. If there's a baptism, there's joy in heaven. We've said it publicly. We'll continue to say it. As an eldership, when someone's baptized, we're not applauding. We say it, amen, because there's joy in heaven. A sinner is saved by grace. It's not a show. When I come on this pulpit, don't applaud. I'm not putting on a show. And even the Lord, we have to be reminded in the church that oftentimes we get into this, you know, encourage, but we don't want to exalt. So the Bible says, be ye of this one mind, full of compassion. Read. Love as brethren. Love as brethren. Here it is. Be pitiful. Be, pitiful. be courteous. Be courteous. As children of God, this should be our kind, our character, our mindset. The man wanted to be healed. Man couldn't be. Jesus, today, if you are to be saved, it's only on the Jesus is the one. We should be full of compassion as children of God. And as we close out today, I hope you understand that, that when that price was paid on Calvary's cross, we sing this song, he bore it all. He bore it all. See, Isaiah 53 and 6 is all we like sheep have gone astray. But the Lord laid on him. The Lord laid on him the iniquity, the lawlessness, the sin of us all. So what do you want today versus what you need? You may say, well, no, we, we, I want to just get up and I just want to just be energized by hearing anybody preach. No, what you need is the word of God. See, the Bible lets us know in Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 8, be ye not therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask him. Matthew 6 and verse 8. So let's put aside our wants. Let's focus on what we need. We all need to be saved. We all have gone astray. And God put on Jesus the iniquity of us all. When was the price paid? The price was paid at Calvary's cross. The price was paid on the cross at Calvary. When Jesus hung in the midst, died, shed his blood, and when his, in the shedding of his blood, he purchased the Lord's church. The church belongs to Christ. He is the head. King Jesus is the authority in the Lord's church, his kingdom. And I hope, trust, and pray that those that are here today will recognize that in order to do God's will, we must obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is not, with all the love in my heart, it is not a sinner's prayer. People want to be saved and they say, it's not asking Jesus to come into your heart. 
It is not, let me just leave, let, let me leave a, a tithe, a tenth portion. No. You got to obey the gospel. So he just man didn't know who Jesus was, but he did what he said. You can come to know Jesus today. Jesus Christ died for our sins. He was buried and rose again the third day. Paul wrote to the church of Christ at Corinth. The facts of the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. And so don't be ashamed because Paul talked about it in Romans chapter 1 and verse 15. For as much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is, it is the good news, the power of God unto salvation. See, God has all power, but he only uses one power to save our souls. It, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news concerning Christ, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, but also to the Greek. One church, one body, one kingdom, one ark of safety for the sins of the world. Do you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins? Because see, again, some people hope. What do you hope for? You hope for heaven? But you can't make it to heaven unless you get into Christ. Not my words, the words of Christ. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. Do you believe that? Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. If you believe that with all your heart, are you willing to change your mind? Repent. Upon that changing of your mind, are you willing to confess Jesus Christ to be the Son of the living God? Because if you confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God, we will immerse you in water today. None holy about this water. See, people take advantage of what people that are desperate. Don't ever be desperate. The snake oil salesman. People, you go on Amazon and buy some holy water. Don't do that. So just trust God. Trust God. Hear, believe, repent, confess, you'll be immersed in water for the remission of your sins, Acts 22 and verse 16. Your sins are washed away. When you obey God, believe in God, trust God, he will save our souls. And then you rise up to walk in a brand new way of life and faithful unto death. There's only one thing that's going to save our soul and it's the power, it's the blood of Jesus Christ. We must come into contact with the blood of Christ. If any of us here today going back to Bethesda for just a minute, was feeling just so badly, and you don't know how to describe it, you'd probably go to a hospital. You'd go see a doctor. So we have enough sense. We have the wherewithal. When there's a drastic need, we seek to get immediate help. Christ, can, if you are outside the body of the church of Christ today, why not be saved? There's an urgency. There's an urgency. You must go to the water to come into contact with the blood. So if you're here today and you want to respond, those on the Zoom chat, start putting your information in right now, your, your prayer request. God is working now. He's working every day through his son, Jesus Christ. You need to respond. Please come right now as we together stand and sing the song of encouragement. Won't you come? There's power in the blood. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power. In the blood of the Lamb, there is power, power, wonder-working power. In the precious blood of the Lamb, would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a clean to Calvary's time. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb.